Good morning. Welcome to Worship with Messiah Lutheran Church in Amherst, New Hampshire on August 16th for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome to our Messiah community and a special word of welcome to anyone else who's found us online. We're glad you're here with us. It's a blessing to have you here. We hope and pray you'll be blessed by being a part of this service. As we begin, we want to offer thanks to the folks who help us put the service together. One license, Dakota Road, CCLI, Augsburg Fortress. We're grateful for these folks for granting us the licenses and permissions to use the service and the music and to stream them online. We are grateful for these ministry partners. Christ is risen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God. We confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us and in your spirit lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. 
Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord. 
Let us pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Isaiah, the 56th chapter. Thus says the Lord, Maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who, who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Word of God, word of life. May God be merciful to us and bless us. May the light of God's face shine upon us. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide all the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth its increase. God, our own God, has blessed us. May God give us blessing. And may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. Reading from Romans, the 11th chapter. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. Word of God, Word of Life.
the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 15th chapter. Jesus called the crowd and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind, and if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please join me in a word of prayer. May the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in middle school, I was what you might call a reluctant learner. And we had assigned to us to read uh, Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. And then we were to write an essay on it. And this was due on a Monday. And... You know, I tried to read that quite a few times. I never really got much further than it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and then I'd doze off. As I said, I was a reluctant learner. Well, it was due on a Monday, and it was a Sunday morning, and I was at our home in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I was watching TV on that Sunday morning. This was long before my church-going years. I was watching professional wrestling on Channel 18 from Milwaukee. We had subscribed to this new thing called cable TV, and I was uh, taking advantage of it to its fullest. And at the end of the pro wrestling show, there was uh, uh, an announcement. Stay tuned. Family Theater is coming up next. It's Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. And I just saw my opportunity, and I went and I got some paper, and something to drink, and I took copious notes during this video presentation, and I wrote uh, an essay, and I turned it in, and I think I got one of my best grades in that English class. It was a miracle. I was saved by the programming gurus of Channel 18 out of Milwaukee. You know, it's really rather sad that back in that time, I didn't read a whole lot further than it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Here is the beginning. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was an age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. 
In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on it being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. We could spend so much time expounding on this text and, and how it speaks to our day in this world right now with what's before us. But what catches me about this opening today is it seems to speak to the gospel text of the last couple weeks. It was the best of Jesus. It was the worst of Jesus. We capture a glimpse of the best of Jesus a fortnight ago in the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus is full of compassion and love for those in need, and he responds fully. The disciples try to send the crowd away, but Jesus will have absolutely none of it. Jesus' first and only response is to care for those sheep without a shepherd. If you look in the Mark account, that verbiage is there. Jesus lingers after the meal to personally dismiss the crowd. In the midst of his grief over John the Baptist having been killed, he finds a place in his heart for these strangers who had a need only he could fulfill. It was the best of Jesus. And then we catch a glimpse of the worst of Jesus in today's gospel text. Jesus seems not even to have the time of day, let alone compassion, for this Canaanite woman seeking relief for her daughter, who is enduring demonic torment. He just ignores her. He doesn't even respond initially. The disciples, playing their familiar role, want to send her away, just like the crowds a fortnight ago. They want to send away the one in need. And Jesus seems more than willing to be the one to send her away, to engage with them. It's a very different response from Jesus. His first and disturbing response is to tell this sheep without a shepherd that he was only sent to the flock of the house of Israel. He wasn't sent for the likes of her. So much for leaving the 99 on the hillside and going and finding the one that is lost. So much for the good shepherd who lays down his life. So much for sheep not of this flock etc etc this runs counter to so many different teachings and instances of jesus in scripture this woman comes to jesus looking for a hand and he shows her his palm but this woman persists falling to her knees and saying lord help me and jesus shuts her down saying there is no room at the table that she is not welcome, her daughter is not welcome, that the bread that's on the table might not go around. We need to save it for the children of Israel. Stark contrast to 12 baskets fulls of leftover after feeding 5,000 a fortnight ago. So much for, I am the bread of life, all who come to me will never hunger. He punctuates his rejection by calling her a dog, saying we can't be wasting the kids' foods on the dogs. And you have to understand that dogs weren't adored and thought of so fondly as they are this day. Dogs were mangy, dirty animals. He calls this woman a mangy, dirty animal and says we don't have room for you here. And in contrast to lingering to dismiss all the people who have been fed at the feeding of the 5,000, he lingers to personally insult and dismiss this woman before she even gets to the table. In the midst of her grief over her tormented daughter, Jesus couldn't find a place in his heart for this woman, even though he was the only one who could fulfill her need. Truly, this was the worst of Jesus. 
And so I want another miraculous insertion in the best of times and the worst of times for something to fall out of the sky, not so that I can get a paper done without having read the, the text, but I want this text to be dealt with. I want a, a silver bullet to fix what Jesus said or to come up with the right explanation. But it's hard. And people have tried, and I've probably tried, but I just don't feel up to the task today. This is an awful teaching about Jesus. What I really want to do is invoke the uh, dedication of the seminal work of the five Gospels, the works of the Jesus Seminar. Uh, the book was called The Five Gospels, What Did Jesus Really Say? And if you don't recall this group, this was a group of historical critical scholars who got together and looked at all the texts of Jesus and voted on their authenticity. And if it was uh, deemed very authentic, it was printed in red. And if it was deemed very inauthentic, it was printed in black. And there was gradations between them. And it was a way of saying, we're not sure everything in Scripture uh, was said by Jesus just as it's recorded. And in this book, which I'm not defending or, or attacking right now, there is a dedication and it says this, this report is dedicated to Galileo Galilei, who altered our view of the heavens forever. To Thomas Jefferson, who took scissors and paste to the Gospels. To David Friedrich Strauss, who pioneered the quest of the historical Jesus. Now, of course, as a trained physicist in my undergraduate work, I have nothing but love for Galileo. And I commend to you, in fact, the Indigo Girls' song, Galileo. This church has made so many missteps when it comes to science. We have so much repentance and, and, and hard work to do. But that's not for this morning. It's the Thomas Jefferson and the David Friedrich Strauss part of the dedication that call out to me here. Thomas Jefferson is said to have taken scissors and paste to the gospel. He cut out all the miraculous things, all the miracles, and went just for the teachings, the, the ethical teachings of Jesus. He redid the gospel, leaving out the parts that he found unpalatable. I kind of want to do that with today's gospel text. And Strauss was, was part of this conversation of, of what did Jesus really say? What didn't Jesus really say? Maybe we can explain away this text by just snipping it out or by explaining that it was something that Matthew added or some later editor or redactor or someone with, a, with an agenda that they forced into the canon. Maybe. But, but the truth is that this scripture is in our canon. And I don't get to wave it away or explain it away. It just becomes a cross as offensive. And you don't either. I wish we could just excise this terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day of Jesus from Scripture. But we can't. And part of what is so troubling is that this text shows that Jesus himself is defiled. The context of this text is this. The Pharisees have been coming after Jesus and his followers for what they eat and how they eat it, who they eat with, if they're ritually clean, if they're socially clean, if they're doing what they're supposed to or not. There have been accusations that Jesus and his followers are defiled, they're tainted, they're unclean, that the company that they keep defiles them, that the way they don't properly wash their hands or their vessels defiles them. And so Jesus responds and says, look, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. That just goes into your mouth and in your stomach and eventually into the sewer. That's not the problem. What defiles you is what comes out of your mouth because it betrays what's in your heart. If you speak of hatred or if you speak of anger or murder or fornication or those sorts of things, you are defiled, which is a beautiful and profound teaching. And then Jesus starts spewing venom at this woman. Jesus' words have evil intentions that are slanderous and bear false witness. In his anger towards this woman, there are words, in his words is culpability for murder. Jesus said, I tell you, if you are even angry 
at your brother. You are guilty of murder. Jesus is in this exchange with this woman, unclean and defiled. He is in need of rebuke. He is in need of forgiveness. He is in need of love and inclusion back into the community. It is a hard thing when your own teachings condemn you. As a preacher, I know this well. Jesus must have known this well, too, on this terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day that is locked into the canon of Scripture forever. There is good news to be had. There is gospel in this text, but it doesn't come from Jesus. It's found in the woman's brilliant and faithful response to Jesus' words. She takes the insult enters into it fully and says, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She says, There is a place for me at this table, even if it's under the table. She says that she can and she must be granted table fellowship. Jesus relents and sets her daughter free. But in truth, I believe it was Jesus himself that was set free. He was upbraided for having too small a vision of who should be included in the meal. There were baskets full of bread on the master's table. And there was many, many basketfuls to fall down to the dogs and beyond. And there would be many, many, many basketfuls of leftover to be had. How did Jesus forget so quickly? The good news is that Jesus let this outsider, this Canaanite woman... A woman without a name worthy to be recorded or any real social standing. She let that woman show him how to be more inclusive and more gracious. I like to think and believe that this woman shaped Jesus' ministry from this day on, going forward forever. I think it's similar to when Mary washes Jesus' feet in preparation for his burial in the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. I don't know, I don't think, that the washing of the disciples' feet in John 13 would have happened if Mary hadn't dared to wash Jesus' feet in John 12. Mary showed him in this beautiful and humble act of service how it could be. And he learned. I like to think that Mary shaped Jesus and his ministry during Holy Week through this act. And it shaped his disciples, and it shaped the early church, and it shaped the church to this day forward, going on forevermore. This sermon today was helped along by the sermon of a good friend of mine, Jenny English, Pastor Jenny English, who was a classmate of mine at seminary, that she entitled, The Time Jesus Got It Wrong. And also by Debbie Thomas's commentary, is it good news yet? The good news isn't that Jesus is flawless and perfect in every circumstance. He was brought up in a toxic, racist society and was born fully human. His divinity didn't spare him from the ills and the failures that surround us and shape us. He needed to be taught and corrected. He needed to be loved and forgiven. He needed to be brought back into community and to be shown how to bring others into community as well. And if Jesus wasn't flawless and perfect in every circumstance, how about us? We surely are not flawless and perfect in every circumstance. We're closer to being flawless and to flawful and imperfect in every circumstance. We, too, are brought up in a toxic and racist society, and our humanity bears itself to the world all too often. The ills and failures that surround us and shape us are truly at play. We need to be taught and forgiven, taught and corrected, loved, and forgiven, restored to community, and shown how to restore others to community as well. The good news 
is that the author and perfecter of our faith will teach us and correct us. The good news is that the author and perfecter of our faith loved us to the point of dying for us and for all on the cross. The good news is that the author and perfecter of our faith forgives us and showers us with grace and a place at the table, at the top of the table, where the people sit. The place that, where there are more than enough places for those that we might deem unworthy. And we have an opportunity to learn from Jesus' terrible, horrible, very bad, no good day, and instead grow into having wonderful, glorious, not bad, very good days that we can share with all who will come. Will we dare? Please, pray with me. God, we thank you for this Canaanite woman, and for Mary, and for what they taught Jesus and for how they teach us. Give us hearts never to exclude others longing for God's healing. Give us grace to let all teach us to be more as you would want us to be. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we pray this morning, we will use the following response. Lord, in your mercy. Confident of your care and help by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, you gather the church to be part of your mission as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. As Jesus acknowledged the great faith of a woman from outside his people, help your church discover and find blessing in the faith of people we might reject. Lord, in your mercy. You have blessed us with the bounty of the earth. Grant your grace to all your creatures that the earth will flourish. Relieve waters choked by garbage, renew soil stripped of nutrients, and refresh the air all creatures need to live. Lord, in your mercy. You call the nations to be glad and sing for joy. Let your way be known among all the nations of the world, now divided by competing interests, contending alliances, and consumed by enormous worry. Bless us and make your face shine upon all. Lord, in your mercy. You show unexpected mercy, kindness, and generosity. We pray for those who do not have enough, for outcasts in our villages, cities, and town, and for those who need your healing, especially Kim and Chris, Charlie, Harold, Taffy, Ed, John, Al, Mark, Carl, Jean, Bryant and Janet, Keith, Bud, Mercedes, Mark, Eric, Lori, Steve, Jenny, Terry, the Barr family, Stephanie, Ann, Jack, Pastor Tim Roser, Evelyn, Chuck, John, the Wallace family, the Lemaire family, and Anne Marie House. Lord, in your mercy. If you, if you, in you, we live and move and have our being, grant our congregation grace to find your fresh life in you. Accompany us in the rhythms of late summer. Give us rest and renewal and strengthen us for mission in your name. Lord, in your mercy.
other intercessions may be offered. Your eternal promises are more than we could ever imagine. As you gather all the saints, join us also with them on the great day of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. At this time, I invite you to share peace with those around you in your household or on the comment thread or whoever else you want to share the peace with. We'll give some time for this. As we continue with our offering, uh, I'd encourage you to continue to share the peace with those around you and those online in the, the chat box as well. Thank you so much for your faithful support of the ministries of Messiah Lutheran Church. We're in good financial standing because of your generosity and your faithful stewardship. You are a blessing to the church and to those that the church helps through those offerings. Thank you so much. Let us pray. Merciful God, everything in heaven and on earth belongs to you. We joyfully release what you have entrusted to us. May these gifts be signs of our whole lives returned to you, dedicated to the healing and unity of all creation through Jesus Christ. Amen. Together we pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever amen
receive a blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Just a reminder that the church has a Zoom room we've been making use of. The meeting ID is 541-282-7735 and the password is 544430. Or you can get in there without a password using www.tinyurl.com slash messiahnhzoom. Or you can go to the church website, www.messiahnh.org and follow the link there. It's where we have coffee hour after worship on Sundays. Pastor's office hours are there on Tuesday and Thursday at 3 o'clock, and the virtual choir uh, meets after Tuesday worship on Wednesdays. We hope you'll come join us uh, for any or all of those. Thank you. If our church Facebook page is ever being moody, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, www.tinyurl.com slash YouTube. We are putting all our services there as well as a backup. Please feel free to subscribe. Steve Erdemo and Maria Regina Pietri Giraldi, who goes by Regina, are getting married on next Saturday, August 22nd. Please keep this couple in your prayers as they enter into this covenant together. Thank you so much. The New Hampshire Highway Cleanup Program has just started back up. Messiah will be taking care of our two miles of Route 101 on Saturday, August 29th. Uh, we will meet at the church at 8 o'clock. If you'd like to be part of this socially distanced service project, please email Deanna Courts and let her know you'll be joining us. Gloves, bags, and reflective vests will be provided. Participants must be over 15 years of age. Thanks. We have a Bible study on Thursdays in the church Zoom room. Uh, it's 9 in the morning and 7.30 in the evening. We hope you'll join us and help get the word out. Thank you. We're going to have a favorite hymn sing Sunday on August 23rd. If you have any uh, hymns you'd like to be considered for that morning, please get them to Linnea by Wednesday, August 19th. We're asking that you select hymns that are found in our hymnal, the ELW, a.k.a. Evangelical Lutheran Worship, a.k.a. the Cranberry Hymnal. Thank you. We are going to make another effort to have an online bunco game on our Zoom room. We're hoping to get at least three tables worth, which would be 12 different players. It's going to be on Friday, August 28th at 7 o'clock. If you don't know how to play Bunko, there's a little instructional video on our YouTube channel as well as on Facebook. We hope you'll join us. Thanks so much. Our next worship service will be this Wednesday, our Tizay worship service. If you haven't tried it yet, uh, Tizay is a slower, a little more repetitive, a little more meditative service. Uh, we've been spending some time looking at some Christian symbols as well for a, a focus on our meditation. I hope you'll join us if you're available and you're welcome to stay afterwards for our virtual choir in the Zoom room. Thank you so much. Surely he
mercy shall daily attend you. Ponder on what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriend you. Praise to the praises before him. Let the Amen sound from his people again. Glad me forever adore him. Christ is risen just as he said. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Have a blessed day. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us on Wednesday for today's worship at 7 o'clock.